Um, my name is David Kurtz. I am uh, one of the veterinarians at the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. And again, this is the first of our interactive session. And actually, let me take that back. The second, um, Mr. Bruce Kennedy uh, yesterday um, took you through the steps of using the poll everywhere online um, questioning. And we're going to be using that again as well. But I wanted to start off, because this is interactive, with just a real quick quiz. All right, I want somebody other than the government agencies to stand up and tell me what is CFR 71.52? How about USC 7? Or 9 CFR? There you go. There was a couple of them. It, it is incredibly confusing. And I think um, Lita, the question she asked there at the end of the whole panel, the whole point of what I'm going to talk to you about is planning. Dr. Simmons yesterday, and when he talked about the non-human primates, um, you know, he started off with his presentation. The most important part is planning, planning, planning. And it is, because you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to move these animals safely and efficiently. Um, and that takes a lot of pre-planning. And you've heard bits and pieces throughout yesterday and today, um, especially this morning, of the mountain of government regulations. And that's just in the US. You know, so we're going to talk about when you export to um, other countries, and it's the same thing there as well. There is a mountain of government regulations. And it's, it's very difficult for one person to bring all that together. So what I'm trying to do is I'm going to walk you through the process of you are an animal shipping coordinator at your institution, and you're responsible for getting animals from point A to point B. So the secondary title I, I have on this talk is everything I need to do before the animals ever even leave the door. You know, the more planning you have up front, the less chance of something happening that might affect animal health and welfare. So again, we're going to be using the, the poll everywhere. I went ahead and put this slide up here just to go ahead and give you an opportunity to, to get ready. I'm not, we're not going to actually start using it for uh, about halfway through the talk. I actually recommend people going to the website, even if you have a, a smartphone. It's a lot easier to answer the questions if you do it through the URL. Um, there's actually even a Poll Everywhere app if you want to take the time to download it. Um, if you download it right now, I've got it here on my smartphone, you'll see that it's got a picture of a pie. It's basically saying, you're not going to see the questions until I present them, but you're ready to go. You can also use you, know, you can also use the texting capabilities like we did yesterday. All right, so let's let's go. Everybody's probably familiar with some of these images. You know, we may have seen dogs at an airport or traveling down the highway. You know, you see a horse trailer or a livestock trailer, and, and um, we're familiar with these. We may even have done it ourselves, taking our dogs on a trip, or if we've got horses that we transport across state lines. What I hope to do is, is kind of walk you through how complex this process is and um, how it, it's not one thing that one person can do. It takes a team effort. Well, here now, there we go. All right, so I'm, I'm a veterinarian, so I take the perspective always of animal health. And so when I look at, at the objectives of moving animals from one place to the other, I, I tend to go from the, the animal health standpoint. And I think first and foremost is we want to make sure that we're maintaining animal health and well-being. In my opinion, that's the most important thing that we do. And we, because we care about these animals, we care about their well-being, and we want to make sure that we're doing this safely and effectively for them. We want to minimize their stress. We're not going to eliminate it. That's, that's an unrealistic expectation, as anybody that traveled to this trip or traveled anywhere realizes. It can be stressful. But we want to do everything we can to minimize those things we can control during the whole process. We want to minimize the duration. Get them there as quickly as possible. We want to get them there safely, but also quickly as possible. And as we kind of got, a, got an idea this morning of all the different um, agencies that spoke to, you want to make sure that you're in, um, meeting all the regulatory compliance. 
That is one area that can cause a delay. And you need to utilize these different agencies because they are valuable resources to help you with the process. So if you boil it down to a very simple process, it's four questions. What, where, when, and how. The first two are, are usually pretty easily and quickly answered. An example is an investigator comes to you and says, I need to transport these animals here. There you've got it, you know what you're doing. The when, most of the time the PL say, I need them tomorrow. And, um, but that takes a little bit more time sometimes in, in the planning of when that happens. It's the last question, how am I gonna do this quickly and safely? and maintaining animal health and welfare that takes the most planning. Like I said a little bit earlier, and I think that you've gotten a, a feel with all the different speakers we've had from all the different industries. It's, it requires a team effort. There are many stakeholders in this process, and every one of these stakeholders has res a responsibility in making sure that, that there's a safe transport of laboratory animals. Now, probably for the last 10 years, I've, I've dealt primarily with rodents. And um, whenever I deal with uh, an investigator coming to me and say, I'd like to import these animals um, into my institution, the first question I always ask them, are there frozen embryos or sperm available? That, in my opinion, there, there are a number of reasons why I recommend cryopreservation of, of rodent strains. Mouse, mouse in particular are the primary ones that we, we cryopreserve. As we learned yesterday, um, I was glad to hear also that fish, we can cryopreserve fish sperm. So that's, a, that's another species that we can deal with in this form or fashion. And we do it for a number of reasons. We do it for disaster planning. We want to make sure that if anything were to happen to the live animals on the shelves, we have the ability to go back and regenerate these because um, these are very costly and expensive animals. Um, if there's a disease outbreak, we can go back to a clean population. If there's a genetic drift over time that changes the phenotype of that animal. And finally, transportation. Transporting germplasm is so much easier. You know, basically you are transferring biological materials. We don't have to be concerned about the feed and the water and the, the ambient temperature. We are, we do have to make sure that they're maintained frozen, but we have the special shippers that can do that. But everything else is we're shipping biological materials. All right, one of the first questions that I ask when I'm, when I'm starting to plan a shipment out of my facility is, all right, what's the animal's health status? Is there any physical conditions that the animals may have that in, can impact their travel? And as um, Dr. Anderson spoke about yesterday, there are a lot of things that we have to consider. And in my opinion, if as a veterinarian I come across some type of physical condition that I say, you know what, these animals cannot withstand the stress of travel, they cannot travel, you can just stop there. There's no point in continuing the planning. You could either postpone it until the animals are, are physically capable or consider alternatives. Also, um, Dr. Kate Pritchett Corning yesterday talked about the health status of the animals. And this has to deal with really, um, you know, their different institutions have different health requirements, especially we're primarily talking about rodents. We're talking about specific pathogen-free colonies. Not all institutions are the same. An example I, I use is, is Helicobacter. There's a bacteria that um, is common in most mammalian species. Um, we have found that certain strains of Helicobacter bacteria can cause some issues in mice. Some institutions, like our institution, is a small institution, and we, can, we were able to actually eliminate Helicobacter, but a lot of, lo especially large institutions, have not been able to, to completely eliminate it. We won't accept animals directly in that have Helicobacter. So if you're shipping animals out, you need to make sure that the, con the receiving institution will receive them, or the whole thing is, is dead. You've got to stop there. Then we start thinking about, okay, how am I going to get them there? What mode of transportation are we going to use? And as most people yesterday talked about, really 
airplane or ground transportation are really the two primary mechanisms used. Um, there is some transfer by ship. Um, usually, I think, from my understanding, the, the majority of time is usually between the UK and, and um, the continental Europe. And trains really aren't used that often. But what we want to do is we want to use the quickest and most direct route with the minimal number of transfers. And that was one thing that was touched on a little bit. A lot of research has shown, especially the animals that are hooked up to, say, um, EKG monitors, monitoring their heart rate, blood pressure, things like that. The most stressful time for the animals are when the crates are actually physically being moved. When a crate, crate's placed in a truck, when a crate's placed on an airplane, the animals start to kind of calm down. But when that truck stops, opens up, and it's being unloaded, then you're, you're getting new sounds, you're getting new smells, people are talking. Those are the most stressful times for the animals, and we want to try to minimize those. If we decide that, we're, that the air transport is going to be our primary mechanism to use, you know, we, wanted, we want to kind of vet the airlines and vet the companies that will be transporting these and, and try to make sure that um, we're maintaining animal health and welfare. Um, you know, are the holding areas environmentally controlled? You know, do we need to worry about temperature variations? Um, not only in the holding areas, but also within the cargo areas of the plane. And as we heard yesterday from the, the gentlemen, the folks from the airline industries, sometimes that's, that's a problem that we have to, to deal with and we have to m make sure that, um, you know, that we're not doing it in such a way that they're going to uh, be exposed to temperature extremes. We want to have minimal time um, on, you know, between holding and loading. And I kind of term that as the, the, the last on, first off. You know, try to make sure um, that, that, you know, when you're delivering these animals, you say, listen, let's get those on, be the last one on the plane, so they're not on the tarmac for an extended period of time, and then when you land, they're the first ones off. You know, it is, does the airline allow for um, accessibility to the cargo area? Not all planes do. Some, um, some do, some don't. But if possible, then that allows an opportunity for the animals actually to, to be observed during transit. And does the airlines have an emergency veterinary plan? As, we, as one of the you know, speakers yesterday, that sometimes some of the airlines actually do have veterinary consultants available. If an, a health issue arises, either the animal becomes sick or the animal is injured. Ground transportation. Um, as uh, Mr. Fernandez talked about yesterday, you know, a lot of the trucks, we want to we want to find out what kind of trucks do the company are the companies using? Do they have redundant HVAC and power supplies that if for some reason um, the primary um, HVAC system goes down, it can immediately kick on. And this is especially important for long hauls, you know, cross country several hours. You know, short trips across, you know, across town or something like that, you know, it, a prior, you know, having a backup is not always necessary, but making sure at least that the primary one is functioning properly. Um, do they have GPS capabilities? Not only so the drivers don't get lost, which can happen, but also it allows the companies to track the vehicle in, um, in route. Is the vehicle constructed in a way that we're not posing any risk primarily to the health status, the microbiological status of the animals. Is the cargo area made of non-porous flooring and walls that's, that can be easily sanitized and disinfected? And again, same thing for ground transportation. Do they have uh, kind of emergency plans in place, not only for medical issues, but also service-related issues, say, if the truck breaks down? Probably the majority of um, you know, transfers that take place usually involve um, some type of animal, animal com carrying company, either a carrier or a broker, or they may actually also use intermediate handlers. And those companies can go across the whole spectrum on, on what they handle. There are some companies that they will handle every aspect. They will pick it up at your door and they will deliver it to the final destination. And there are very, very, uh, there are several very reputable companies out there that have a lot of experience. Um, and my opinion, I think these companies are, are really beneficial when um, doing international shipments because they've got the experience 
in securing the proper documentation. They know what documents are needed. So I strongly encourage when, when going through this planning process that you consider looking at some of these companies for help. But you need to vet them properly. Don't just pick somebody out of the, of the phone book and th that says, yeah, we deliver animals and call them up and let them take your animals away. You need to be comfortable with them. You need to review their training process and their experience. Are they experienced in handling min miniature pigs? You know, or can they handle non-human primates? Um, you, know, you need to make sure that they understand what are the needs of the, of the specific species that you're, interest that you're interested in transporting. Make sure that they are, they are doing this legally. Make sure that they have all of, of the um, accurate registrations, permits, licensure. That's the, one of the last things you want to do is find out that um, you're using a company that is not registered with the USDA and all of a sudden your shipment is just is delayed. It's held up. Review their procedures for monitoring during, during transport. Just flat out ask them, all right? You know, this trip is, is 12 hour grand transportation. Um, you know, are you gonna meet the, the animal welfare requirements for observations every four hours and feed and watering? Review their feed and watering process and then ask them where their contingency plans. Just, all right, if X happens, what are you gonna do? That's where we get into actually creating a written journey plan. And I strongly recommend, regardless of the shipment, that you actually develop a written plan. It's one that everybody can be on the same page before the animals actually leave the door. Um, a lot of the, most of the EU countries actually require either a journey declaration or um, some type of a written plan that describes all the different segments of the journey that they'll be taking. Timing is another thing. You need to look at your calendar. You know, what may impact the, the transport? You know, the seasonal variations in the weather or their holidays. Weather conditions, another thing. I mean, again, this is the list that you just need to make. While it might be beautiful and sunny in Southern California, which um, they all say it always is, um, that may not be the case at your final destination. You need to tr find, you know, look at the weather forecasts for every stop of, of the transport and f make sure that there's nothing on its way. You know, do you have a hurricane coming over towards the east coast that may cause a delay and divert your shipment? Should you just, if that's the case, can you hold off for a week or two until um, that is passed? As we saw this morning, there is a mountain of forms and permits that are required, um, not just for you know bringing animals into the country, but also exporting the animals. International um, shipments. Sometimes those forms and documents need to be in the language of the, the destination country. You need to make sure that they, you've got them and they're ready because that will cause a delay. You know, make sure that you have the correct number of original copies. The the border inspection. Um, po you know, or border inspection posts or the, or the um, customs places, they want original copies of these documents. So I always sign my documents in blue ink. That's just kind of one way that they feel confident that this is an original document and not a photocopy. Um, I, always, I always was told that when doing international shipments, you should have an original copy for every border you cross. Now, the gentleman from, from London yesterday um, told us, and I was not aware, that, that when entering an EU, if you're entering into an EU country and you're cleared in an EU country, then you can cross borders within the European Union. I would still suggest go ahead and put those documents in there just in case. You know, again, you're wanting to, to minimize the chance for any delays. And make sure that your documents are put in a, in a place that is easily accept, accessible by the customs people at the border. Now it's time to start thinking about you know, packing up the animals. You're getting closer, making sure that we use the appropriate container or crate that it meets the animal welfare regulations or the IATA guidelines for transfer. 
Is it possible to inspect the animals? Make sure that the crate you're using allows for adequate observations, um, you, especially with SPF animals. You know, you don't want them opening the box. Do we need to separate the animals during transport, like we see here in a rodent cage? Um, you know, if, if transporting males, you really, uh, especially sexually mature males, you don't want to be grouping them together. They will be fighting and they will have problems. Um, animal identification. You know, most uh, USDA covered species and, and those covered under the CITES permits require individual identifications. Make sure that you've got that documented. Rodents generally don't require individual documentation, but you need to f find out and make sure. What kind of bedding material? Um, you know, as, as Carol talked about this morning with some of the wood beddings, you've got to be careful about crossing the borders. Um, China is one where you can't, Im you can't send rodents with wood, our standard wood bedding into China, so we have to use a paper-based bedding. What about food and water? How am I going to make sure that the animals have um, access to appropriate amounts of food and water? Now, rodents, well, you know, it's, it's pretty simple because we just pack them up with their food and a water source, usually the, you know, like the gel packs. Um, and you want to make sure when you're, when you're packing them where you would not be providing additional food or water that you anticipate delays. So I usually recommend a minimum adding an, at least 24 hours worth, if not two times the expected journey duration. Just go ahead and adding it to the crate. Other animals that are being transported where, where um, obviously we don't want to be um, having water bowls in, in their cages that, we, that we're providing them food and water at the appropriate times. You know, the animal welfare covered species, they have to be offered water at least every 12 hours. You know, they can be offered more in food at least every 24 hours. This document here is, is, is not, a, it's not a required document by um, really almost any country, but it's a, it's a good document to have in place. And what that is, is you're actually documenting when the animals are observed and when food and water is offered. USDA does require that the statement is provided that the animals have been provided food within four hours of departure and that animals are observed every four hours and animals are offered food and water at 12 and 24 hours. This is a way that you can document that. If it's not documented, then there's no way you can prove that it happened. So include this and make sure that the carriers understand that it's important that they complete this accurately. Labeling the container. Again, don't want to have anything that's going to delay the shipment. Um, uh, the animal welfare regulations have specific requirements for animal labeling that these letters have to be at least one inch high and that um, the orientation arrows need to be in position as well. We saw this label here for um, shipping SPF animals, making sure that, the, you know, that they don't open the crate. And then having contact phone numbers. I think that is crucial to these shipments, again, because if something happens, you know, when they were talking this morning with the, the um, customs agent, you know, if, if an animal is seized, what do they do? They, they're going to want to call somebody. Obviously, they'll call Fish and Wildlife Services, but the other stakeholders need to be contacted. You know, sometimes decisions need to be made as quickly as possible. You know, make sure that all the important stakeholders, that everybody has their contact phone numbers. And make sure that they, you know, ask, are these landlines or are these cell phone numbers? Obviously, if the, the drivers and ground transportation, you want to make sure that they have cell phones. So if they're stuck somewhere out in the middle of the highway, that they can call into the appropriate um, individuals. And they need to be, those individuals need to be available 24-7 during the transfer. The person sending the animals needs to be available. The institution receiving the animals, you know, especially if it's held, let's say, international shipments held in customs. And, you know, the um, sending institution is 12 hours um, you know, behind the time schedule. They need to contact somebody locally to say, okay, what do we, what do, we do? So again, that's one of the responsibilities of the receiving institution. 
personal protection equipment, making sure that the individuals that are actually handling the animals are trained and aware of what they need to do to protect themselves. Whether it be just wearing gloves and a mask, when, you know, generally when handling rodents, um, to you know, full gear for handling non-human primates. It's all about risk assessment, but making sure that the people that are going to be physically handling the animals are comfortable and um, trained in using the material. And an emergency rescue network, and this was, this was something that from my understanding is really starting to develop um, based on the um, USDA contingency plan ruling, even though it hasn't taken place. That contingency plan was also required planning for during shipment. And so um, the Animal Transport Association is one that has strongly endorsed these type of emergency rescue networks. Not only a transportation network, say if there's a mechanical failure of the truck, you know, can I call somebody to quickly get a replacement vehicle or repair that, in a way not to, to delay the shipment? And a veterinary medical network. You know, if for some reason the animals become ill or injured, can I get veterinary medical care to these animals as quickly as possible? And again, making sure this is all in place beforehand, before they actually leave the door. All right, so now we've walked through the process, hopefully. You guys are ready to ship. Welcome to your first day on the job as your shipping coordinator. Again, we're going to use the interactive sessions. We're going to use the poll everywhere. You can either use your cell phone. Again, it's the same number as yesterday, 22333. Or again, it's much easier using the URL because you just have to click on the answer. All right, so your first responsible shipment is, is you have a PI that has come to you and says, I need to ship 20 of my genetically modified mice from North Carolina to Berlin, Germany. And it's May. So all right, we can do that. Yep. Here's our first question. What's the most appropriate, appropriate primary method of transport for mice from North Carolina to Germany? Or is it a cargo ship, commercial airline, a drone, or a charter airline? So go ahead and... Really? All right, somebody is answering. Is anybody that's gone on the web? So if we go to that URL right there, it's still not going. No. All right, well, I apologize because it was, it was working earlier this morning. Um, I guess probably the best thing then is just, just go ahead and text it in. I, I think what I need to do is I need to sign in. Is that true, Bruce? Do I need to be signed in to the... All right, I apologize. Let me do this real quickly. Otherwise, you can go ahead and text that in if you'd like to. It was hard to come up with another distractor. All right, here. I can't type very well on an iPhone. We have a prompt in the app that says join a presentation. So we need to have your identifier for that purpose. All right, it's still not logging me in as well. I apologize. All right. Well, for right now, let's just go ahead, if you could, just go ahead and do the texting. And at our lunch break, um, I'll work out. We'll figure it out there. So, looks like we've got a lot of answers. The majority of them oddly said a, a commercial rail lines. And that really is, a, is the correct answer. You know, shipping 20 mice, chartering an airplane for 20 mice is going to be an incredibly expensive endeavor. And I'm going to leave the drone to Amazon to see, try and work that out. All right, second question. We're going from North Carolina to Germany. Who do you think would be the best um, 
one to handle the shipment. If you think it's something I could do myself, can I take these over to the FedEx office or the United States Postal Service? Or should I probably invoke the services of an animal carrier or a broker? Actually, I think I know what we need to do now is we actually need to log in on the computer back there that's doing the presentation. So we'll do that at lunch. I apologize. All right, looks like almost 100% of the responses, and that is correct. You know, for an international shipment, because of all the requirements of the documents and, and the complexity of it, best thing to do is to, is to get the services of one of these companies. All right, health status. What's going on with these mice? Well, it turns out oops, that these mice are genetically modified and they have problems regulating their body temperature. Is that going to be a problem? Well, I've worked with animals like these. And from a health standpoint, no. But it, really, the, qu the question that I have is, is there something that we can do to reduce the chance of an issue during this shipment? And that is either, you know, keep the container on a heat source during transport, maybe offer them a high calorie diet, should we group house them, give them nesting material, or just wait until a warmer time of, of the year to ship them. I think most of the people are looking up now, so I'll go ahead and, and move on. The majority of people felt that, that group housing them and providing nesting material. And that, for rodents, that really is the best thing. Um, rodents are social animals. They like to huddle together to keep warm, and they like building nests. And building a nest actually gives them the opportunity to thermoregulate. They get too warm, they move out of the nest. Putting them on a heat source, you run that risk of the whole container getting too warm. Um, giving them a high calorie diet, we learned that a lot of times they don't eat very much during transit. Um, and we could wait till, till warmer months to ship them, but I think if we could group house them and provide nesting material, they should be okay. All right, our calendar. Any dates in May? Now this is a, this is a free text response. So, and again, I apologize, but you'll have to text to 693, or excuse me, text it to 22333, text in 693261, uh, and then you just type in your answer after that. All right, we're getting some answers. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that, there we go. And that's it. That's exactly it. There, you know, you need to look for the the, the holidays of the big ones. And in May, um, May the first is May Day in Germany, and the twenty fifth is Memorial Day here in the U.S. You need to avoid shipping during those times. Make sure we have all the, the correct f forms and permits. And, and luckily, um, shipping mice to, to Germany doesn't require as many permits and, and forms as, say, importing non-human primates into this country. Um, it will require an international health certificate signed by a veterinarian and, and approved by the USDA, even though USDA is not a, not a, um, USD, or mice are not a USDA-covered species. The German border inspection post will want to see one signed um, a, or approved by USDA. A customer's voice that de declaring not only the numbers, but just kind of a base nominal value. And then Germany is one of those countries that does require a written 
um, journey declaration. So that, for, that form that I showed you earlier, you need to have that filled out. Packing, you know, these are our specific pathogen-free mice. We want to make sure that um, we're not exposing them to, um, you know, microbial contamination during transit. We want to make sure that they have plenty of food and water, um, that we're providing this, you know, bedding. You know, we can use our standard wood bedding for insulation as well as absorbency. Um, we need to think about, you know, are we going to need to separate these guys' sex, or do we need to single house any of these guys? And we need to make sure that we've got all our labels properly affixed. And so it's time to ship. So am I okay with the carry that showed up at my door? We had this happen to us once. Somebody pulled up in their personal vehicle, and we said, sorry, you're not taking my animals. Notify German Customs. You know, if possible, at least 24 hours in advance or, um, or as the plane takes off. Make sure that the carrier is at the airport on, on, in Germany prior to the arrival of the plane. So there's, you minimize the time that they're, um, that they're there at the airport. Um, alert the recipient that the animals have left and they should be ready for the depart, you know, ready for their arrival and have them confirm receipt. All right, so you've successfully completed your first one. We'll move on to the second one, which is a little bit more complicated, but I'll try and get through this as quickly as possible. So you have an investigator that is moving to your institution in Alabama, and they are coming from Toronto, and they would like to bring their colony of 10 cinemologous macaques with them. So what's the first document that you should obtain? Um, before you do this, um, before you do the non-human primate shipment, should it be an airway bill, a CITES permit, packing list, or animal health certificate? Okay, looks like we're starting to trickle down. And, and actually, both of those responses are very good answers. Oops, and I'm sorry, I, I had those out of order. But the CITES permit actually is the one that you should go after first because that's going to take the longest. That's a minimum of 90 days um, that, that they need to be notified. As we learned this morning from all the different agencies, there are a lot of different documents that you're going to have to have with this shipment. Not only the, the CITES permits, both the export as well as an import permit, but packing list, that food and water log that I showed you earlier about having. Um, you need to have an international or Canadian animal health certificate, um, a customs declaration, and an airway bill. You know, again, this is a very complicated process, and you need to start this process very early. Who do you need to notify? You know, all the agencies, the, the government agencies were up here. Um, they're going to need to be notified of this pending shipment. Um, on the export side, the Canadian Food Inspection Agencies are the, are the agency responsible for animal exports. Um, obviously, the, the CDC, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, Custom Border and Protection, and the state veterinarians. They need to at least alert them that of this pending transfer. All right, this is a quick, easy question. Can I ship these animals straight from Toronto to Alabama? Yes or no? That's kind of going back and forth. See who's going to win out. It's getting closer. All right, in the interest of time, and I know everybody's getting hungry, we'll move on. The answer is usually no, most often. 
unless you get um, special um, permission from U.S. Fish and Wildlife and CDC, these animals are going to have to be imported through a designated fish and wildlife port and also because they will be required to be quarantined, that they be quarantined at a CDC approved quarantine site. Since we're going to Alabama, luckily Atlanta has both. So we can... Um, Atlanta's in Georgia. Yes, but they, so they have to be transported to Georgia. All right, well, we'll get to that in a minute. So this is a, a multiple leg. <laughs> yes, it's not in Alabama, so we're not going straight to Alabama. We have to go to Georgia first, okay? Um, there, because it's nearby, and that's why we chose Atlanta. So um, they're going to need to be inspected by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, and also they're going to need to be inspected by the CDC and then quarantined at the CDC-approved site. Check your weather reports. Again, this is a, basically a two-leg um, transfer yeah, it is, yeah, where's my thing coming in? Now I'm not working. Ah, there we go. July, August in the south is hot. And if any of you guys that live down there sort of visited, it is hot. And we need to be aware of that. We need to, you know, be prepared to make plans um, to deal with it. All right, the dates. Looking at our calendar, we need to look at July and August. Really, July, July are the ones that we've got specific dates, either the 1st or the 4th, or, or holidays in the two countries that we want to avoid shipping during that week. Make sure that you've got your um, log for observations, food, and water. You've got that as part of the documents that are, that are being transported with these animals. Make sure that your shipping containers meet both animal welfare as well as IATA guidelines. Make, you need to make sure that the animals are fed and watered within four hours of departure. You need to think about, can I, do I have to singly house these animals or can I pair house them? Probably with um, a colony, an established colony of, of cinemologous monkeys, you're probably going to be able to pair house some of these, which is the preferable way to send them. And then make sure your container is properly labeled. Getting through customs. Again, this is where the, uh, the brokers are going to really help Make sure that you've got all the proper documentation and get these through as quickly as possible. Um, get the, the required inspections done, get them signed off, and then moved over to the, the quarantine, um, quarantine facility. All right, once they've been cleared from quarantine, it's time to transport them to their final destination. Is the, is the cargo truck, the ground transportation that you're going to use, acceptable for that transfer? Um, do you have a written journey plan from the, the CDC quarantine area to your final destination? Is the driver going to be alone? You know, or in, in also, does a dri is a driver capable of, of handling non-human primates? And what's the emergency plan you've got in place? You know, is there a GPS? Does he have cell phones? Does a driver have a credit card? So if he, for some reason he's got to make a purchase immediately, he can do that. Biosafety, dealing with non-human primates is probably the most important to make sure that personnel handling the animals are adequately protected. All right, so we have any questions so far? No? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into, this is going to be our lunchtime activity, so I'm giving you homework. We've talked about I hope you guys can read that. I apologize. We talked about all the different steps involved in journey planning, and there is just a, a, a myriad of them. All of them are very important. And what I did here was I list, listed 10 of those. What I want you to do is, is during the lunchtime hour, and you can do this whenever uh, you want to um, until we, we meet back, is I want you to enter in what you feel like is the top three most important. So you, and I'm going to leave this slide up during lunch, and those of you online um, will be able to see it as well. And hopefully here, right at, right at lunch, I'll, I'll make sure we get logged in so you can do it online as well. There's a second part to this, and this is one of the, the drawbacks of Poll Everywhere, is um, I can't put up two polls on the same page at one time. So I also want to give you the opportunity, 
if you don't if you feel that there's an issue or that there's a step in the process that's not up there and you feel it is very important or maybe it's something that we that I haven't talked about you could actually put in a free text by texting um, texting that number followed by your message and we'll be collecting those and I'll actually display those at the end of lunch so um, Go ahead and, and, you know, either before lunch or after you come back up here, we're going to actually have an extended lunch period um, to allow you guys time to, to answer these. And what I want to just kind of, we want to gauge is, is having walked through all this process, you know, what do you think are the ones that will be at the top of your list when creating a journey plan? And with that, I'm going to leave this up here. Um, I guess I'll turn it over to Judy. We're going to break for lunch, and we'll meet back for the second part of my presentation afterwards. Thanks, David, and that was fun. Um, we are going to take um, lunch, and we are going to take about an hour and 15 minutes. That'll give you all time to contemplate um, David's homework for you and um, enjoy a leisurely lunch doing some networking. And those back at home, you can uh, get some uh, of your other work done. We appreciate everybody's um, patience this morning and um, interactions. Thank you. We'll see you at 1.30. I hope that we all had a very good meal and did a good job of feeding those brain cells because something tells me we're going to need them for the next interactive exercise. So with that said, I invite David Kurtz back to the podium. All right. Well, looks like we got the glitch worked out. I apologize for that. What it turned out to be is, is we were logged in to Poll Everywhere under a different sub-account. We were logged in under Bruce Kennedy's and it wouldn't allow you to that would be bad. We wouldn't allow you to actually directly access mine. We fixed the problem, so now if you were to log in on the URL, you'd actually be able to answer that way. And we're going to have a few questions in the second half of this as well, so um, you'll be able to answer them directly that way. So I left the slide up here because I wanted you guys to see this um, when we got back from lunch so we can kind of talk about it a little bit. And again, just to, to summarize, what I had requested was I had listed 10 steps in the journey planning process. Obviously not all of the steps, but kind of a, a conglomeration of several of the committee members of what they felt was maybe kind of some of the more important ones. And I wanted you to rank them. I wanted you to pick three of those, which you thought were the three most important ones. But I also gave you the opportunity, and we'll look at that in just a second, is, is to add any. Um, additional steps that may not have been listed. Um, unfortunately, like I said, I can't show both polls on the slide at the same time. But, you know, what we see is kind of interesting to see the distribution. So obviously, the most important one that, that people responded to was the animals are fit for travel. And, and, you know, I kind of presented that, you know, as it's from the veterinary side, to me, that's the most important as well. You know, is, is this is about trying to maintain their animal health and welfare as best as possible. And if the animals are not fit to travel, it's only going to get worse. Um, using a species appropriate container, you know, making sure that the animals will be safe and arrive at their destination um, safely. You know, we saw a lot of those pictures of um, how animals can escape. And um, believe me, if they're, if they're given the time and they're bored or they're really, you know, they're they're scared or they run out of food, or something like that, they will escape and you'd be amazed at how quickly and easily these animals can. Um, provision of food and water, obviously, especially for extended transports, you want to make sure that we're um, providing them adequate amounts and at proper intervals to make sure that, again, maintaining health and well for these animals. And it looks like the fourth highest one was um, knowledgeable animal carrier and broker. And is hopefully I was able to, to demonstrate to you this is an incredibly complex process with a lot of stakeholders involved. And these brokers are a very valuable resource to help you through this process. 
Um, I was interested, you know, if, if, if anybody, at least here in the audience, um, and if anybody online would like to comment um, now, we can bring it up in a little while. But, you know, any comments that anybody would like to make on why they chose, you know, particular ones? You know, again, there's still a lot of choices for a written journey plan, you know, the approval before shipping of the, of the recipient, you know, pretty much all over the board, but I think, you know, the majority of the ones really did seem to focus on um, direct animal health and welfare. Anybody like to make any comments? No? Okay. Yes, Bob. <laughs> I was one of the people who chose consignee approval prior to shipping, and the only reason I chose that was because all of the rest of the things are a wasted exercise if you don't have that in place first. Exactly. So I felt that that was an important step just because it preceded everything else that followed. And that's one of the things about journey planning um, that you'll see. And, it, and when I was coming trying to put this presentation together, there are steps that you can prioritize from a standpoint of what do you think is most important, but those don't all, all, always go chronologically. And there is a chronological process to this whole thing. There are certain questions that you need to answer first off, because if the answer is no, then there is no point in continuing. You know, are the animals fit for travel? Will the recipient re um, agree to accept the animals? If either of those answers are no, then there's no point in continuing on and involving all these other stakeholders. So again, it's, it's really, looking at, you know, what are the important things you need to remember in planning this, but also you also kind of need to think about the chronological steps and how that may impact um, additional steps as we go along the way. All right, the second one, this is, we just got a few. Um, these were the free text ones that um, people entered in. One is the PI authorization, and obviously um, that's one of those first things that that you need to make sure that um, you know the investigator that actually you want to say owns the animals is okay with transferring them, and this is a, this is an issue that you have to be very careful about given our kind of global trade and, and moving of uh, these genetically modified strains. If you receive a strain from an investigator, um, and you know, they kind of I want to say hold the rights to that that. Um, strain, you, you can't be passing those on without their authorization. You need to be careful about that. You need to make sure that from a legal standpoint, um, you're not overstepping your legal authority. Um, animals actually available, cage labeling for shipment, obviously very important. Again, those are, you want to make sure that say, you know, let's say that, that an investigator wishes to tri um, ship a hundred very specific, you know, 50 males and 50 females, or, you know, specific time pregnant or specific genotypes. You need to make sure that before you go down the road that, um, let's say that the investigator wants to send 20 homozygote knockouts, you know, that the, both of their alleles are knockouts. You need to make sure that you've got the appropriate number of animals. You don't want to have to make two shipments. And I think that's something that I would push back to the investigator. So if you, you know, if you want me to ship these for you, before we go down this process, you need to make sure that you've got the animals available to, to ship here. I cook approval at both ends. That's another one that just came in. That's an excellent answer as well. Um, well if I get a request to ship animals out from my institution, I will not start. The, the investigator is required um, to submit not only a materials transfer agreement between the institutions, but also they need to assure that the receiving institution has the appropriate IACUC approvals to receive the animals and, and continue on with those in research. Appropriate documentation, you know, that is a biggie. I mean, that is one of the things we're gonna talk about, about delays in shipment. And um, that's something that you need to make sure that everything is in place, again, because you don't want to delay these shipments. 
moving the person with your carry to establish face-to-face -face understanding communication exactly again it's part of vetting these companies the companies that provide these services it's your responsibility to make sure that you feel comfortable with the services they're providing that you're comfortable with the procedures um, that they have in place and that um, they're going to they're going to transport those animals safely and effectively so i appreciate the input um, this is good and hopefully you guys are getting a better understanding of of how complex this is all right so let's move on to the second part which is we've planned and planned and planned but if i can get this up here uh come on oh oh no it's showing my answer oh well and this is the best laid schemes of mice and men gang aftagly if anybody didn't see the answer, do they know what that's from? Robert Barron's. Oh, very good. <laughs> I wanted to, I was going to say I was going to buy, buy a person a drink downstairs in the cafeteria. Um, in that I was thinking about, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men. <coughs> and I wanted to make sure that I referenced that appropriately. And I was thinking more of John Steinbeck's novel of a mice and men. It actually, he took that from this 1785 poem from um, the Scottish poet Robert Burns, to a mouse on turning her up in her nest with the plow. And it basically translated to the best laid plans of mice and men often go wrong. And that's what this, this session is about, is we've planned and we've We've thought about contingencies. You know, we've tried to, to pre-plan for as much as possible. But not everything works exactly the, the way that you want it to. And so not only do you need to have that contingency plan, I think one of the important reasons why you have a contingency plan in place is sometimes you have to act very quickly. You need to make those decisions in, um, very quickly and you don't have time to sit and think about okay what would be right if you've gone through your mind multiple times these scenarios in your head usually you're better prepared to deal with um, new and unknown possibilities you know like I said earlier it, it is a, it requires a team effort every one of these stakeholders plays a, a vital and critical role in these transports and they also have specific responsibilities um, you know, the recipient doesn't just need to sit back and wait for the animals to arrive. If the recipient agrees to, to receive these animals, they take on a responsibility. They've got to be able to make sure that they can be present to receive the animals at any given time, especially if there are delays. And there can be a lot of different causes for delays, and we try to think about you know some of those scenarios that may that may arise but sometimes just things happen that we're not prepared for and that can include you know something happening to the animal health during ship and the animal becomes ill the animal becomes injured you know we again that's where we kind of get into our rescue network you know do we have the ability to get proper medical care for those animals along the way if the need were to arise improper documents that's a biggie and and that's something that um, can be avoided very easily if you do proper planning. <clears throat> weather, you know, we try to, we, we take a look at the, the weather forecast. Can't always know for sure. Things happen sometimes at the spur of the moment. Motor vehicle breakdown or accidents. You know, it, that's something that you just, you can plan, pre-plan what you may do if something happens and you hope Nobody wants to get into an accident or have their vehicle break down, but you've got to have something in your mind on what you may do. Drivers getting lost, it happens. They go to unknown areas. It's where having GPS is important and making sure the drivers has cell phones. Work interruptions or strikes, you know, airports, you know, airports baggage handlers go on strike, truckers go on strike. You know, what are you going to do if this happens right in the middle of your transfer? Um, political unrest, you know, we are a global society, we are, we are shipping things everywhere around the world. There's, oftentimes we can't always predict 
what may be going on in other countries and what may happen and something that may cause delays or do we need to divert the shipment for some reason? All right, so let's go to our first question. What do you think is the most common cause for animal shipment delays? Weather, incorrect documents, sick animals, or vehicle issues, breakdowns or accidents? As are people that are on, on the URL, are they able to answer? Okay, we're learning as we go. <laughs> Going back and forth between the two. I think we'll, we'll stop there. I mean, people could keep, keep voting online if they want to. We actually will continue to collect these data. I actually felt that incorrect documents, um, and I, I believe, I can't remember, I think it might have been Dr. Simmons yesterday talked that, that weather is um, a very common cause, but I think especially with international shipments, whether leaving the U.S., going somewhere, or coming into the U.S., Something wrong with the documents is probably one of the most common causes for these type of delays. All right, let's go into our, our first scenario. Remember we were shipping the mice from Germany and North Carolina to Germany. We planned and planned and planned. We had everything in place. We put the animals, um, the, the carrier picked the animals up, took them to the airport, put them on the airplane, and we're all good to go. All right. It doesn't want, there we go. Oops, now it went way far forward. Okay. You get a call at 6 a.m. from your broker. There's something wrong with your documents. The custom invoice, the, the address that was written on the custom invoice doesn't match the recipient address of the journey declaration. And this happens. Oftentimes what happens is, is you may, you may fill in the address for one document and then the carrier looks at the name of the recipient and some actually told me this, they'll go on Google, they'll Google the company, they'll get an address, it's not the same. They're not going to let them pass through customs. So what do you do? All right, I don't want to go too far forward. All right, do we ship them back? Do we panic? Do we fax a copy of the corrected documents? Or do we overnight ship the corrected documents? Nobody's choosing panic. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Well, you're panicking, but it's not paralyzing you. Yeah, but what you didn't tell us is whose address is the correct one? Which correct, in which address? Well, of course, the forms that you filled out were correct. Ah, okay. That's when you call on the phone and say, what is your correct address? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so it looks like the vast majority of people said you fax the corrected import permits and documents. Actually, they're not going to take faxes, copies. <laughs> they want original documents. So you're going to have to f get those over to FedEx or, or UPS or some overnight shipping delivery, the original documents, and get them over there. Luckily, you packed enough food in your crate. You know, with the, with the feed pellets and the water sources, um, you, you anticipated or you provided food for an extended delay. We should always, we always do, always plan for that. So even though the animals had to, had to stay there in German customs for 
24 hours. They had plenty of food and water. The customs officials got the, next, the documents the next day. All was kosher. And um, they were allowed to they were allowed to leave, and the recipient has been alerted that the animals are on their way and they're ready ready to receive them, even though it was 24 hours later. All right, let's go into our non-human primate scenario. I fear when I push this again, it's going to advance it even farther. Angela, can you try the down arrow? See if that does it. I'll try one more time. Ah. All right. Yeah, so that's okay. We're back, we're back here to where I want to be. Amazingly, your shipment to the quarantine facility went off without a glitch. All your, your um, documentation was in place. Your CDC and um, Fish and Wildlife inspections took place. They were placed into quarantine. They passed all of their... Um, TB tests, and they were released after 31 days. Now they're ready to go from Atlanta to, to Alabama, and they're going to go on gr by ground transport. And the expected travel time is about two hours. Not too bad. But in the afternoon, you get a call from the driver, and the truck's overheated, and they can't continue. So, all right, come on, advance. What should the driver do? Ah, well, we can, we can go to that. What should the driver do first? Should he call for a tow to a local garage? Should he pull into a parking lot and go to lunch? Should he pull over, or excuse me, he or she, pull over to the side of the highway, check the animals, and call the consignee? Or should they pull off the highway to a discreet location, check the animals, and call the, their dispatcher? Okay. All right, looks like the vast majority of people picked the last one. Although um, C would be an appropriate answer, but it's a good idea, especially when transporting non-human primates, is to pull off in a quiet, discreet, discreet location. You, know, you don't want to pull off on the side of the highway and get back in the back of the truck, op you know, open up to check on the animals and all the noises of all the cars zooming by and the trucks zooming by. That's going to be pretty stressful to the animals. Um, you know, also, you know, people might get a little bit upset if they see, you know, they happen to be walking by and they see all the, you know, a, a truck full of monkeys sitting there. So, you know, pull off to a quiet area. Check on them, obviously, first. You want to make sure everybody's okay. Make sure that um, the temperature's okay in the cargo area. And then they need to call their dispatcher, get on their cell phone and figure it, tell them, okay, here's the problem and what are we going to do? So, the driver needs to stay with the truck. He better not, he or she better not leave and go for lunch. They better have packed peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. They need to immediately check on the animals, offer them food and water, especially if, if it's, um, you know, it's, if it's been an extended period of time, um, it's going to be hot, and it may be a while before a resolution can come about. Go ahead and offer them food and water. Regularly check the cargo area. Make sure that the temperature is being maintained. Hopefully you're, you, know, you are using a vehicle that has an independent HVAC system. So even though the, that the engine is off, the, the cooling system in the cargo area is run independently and so it's continuing to function. Repair the truck if you can do that in a couple of hours um, and the cargo area can remain stable. If not, you need to, you need to find alternate transportation. Either the, the company that's providing the ground transport locates one of their vehicles in close proximity, or you go to your um, emergency network, rescue network, from a service standpoint. Because some of these companies have actually started you know, to make agreements that if an emergency situation like this arises, we'll step in and we'll help you out. You know, again, because we want to make sure that the animal health and welfare is maintained. So, luckily, 
Um, you know, the, the truck system did have the, the redundant HVAC system, so we were able to maintain proper temperature and ventilation. Although the truck wasn't able to be repaired, the dispatcher was able to loc locate a comparable vehicle in about 30 minutes. Animals were safely transferred to the new vehicle, and they got on their way and finally completed their journey. So luckily in this one, it was only probably a couple of hours. So the whole point of this exercise is, is you need to try to expect the unexpected. You know, things will happen. Even though we plan as best that we can, we need to be prepared to act if something new arises. And that's when, when a point was brought up about your shipping coordinator. You really do need to have a single point of contact at your institutions. One, the person that is um, well-trained in the process, knows all the requirements, knows all the logistics, the one that drafted the journey plan, that person has to be the primary contact and probably should remain so for all of your shipments. You need to have a backup. You know, the people get sick, you know, something happened, they may have to be out and those backups are trained. But for the most part, you don't want to have a bunch of different people in your institution responsible for different parts of the transport and create a journey plan checklist. And that's kind of the, I guess, summation of what I've been trying to present to you about journey planning. The best way to, to, to pre-plan is to have a checklist, have a list of things to go down and you check off in the process of these steps. And, you know, I just went and I listed a lot of those very same steps that we did during the lunchtime session. And then I talked about that we go through, you know, the animal health, on um, the proper approvals, the mode of transportation, when you're going to do it, what's the weather, all of these different things. All the way down to contingency plans. And even as if you just jot down, okay, what do I do if the truck breaks down? You know, what do I do if there's an injury or an animal gets sick? Who, can I, who am I going to contact? Have that, have that checklist you know, ready to go for each one of your, you, know, you just kind of have this template checklist that as a new request comes for a shipment, you walk down that checklist. And finally, I guess the take home message is, is that journey planning um, is a necessary process. You need to do this ahead of time before the animals even leave the door. But also, it's not a rigid process. Um, Bruce Clemens yesterday, I, I, I'm going to steal his, his um, definition of the Otta guidelines. It's an evolutionary document. You know, it's a document that it's your template, it's your starting point. But you need to be prepared to adapt to new situations. You know, when new, new problems arise that you haven't encountered before, you need to go back and say, okay, can I adjust my checklist to add that into my contingency planning? <laughs> and with that, I am done. I, I want a, a list of acknowledgments. There's a lot of people that helped me um, with this. And I want to thank all of them that provided very useful information. Um, even down last minute, Carol Clark and all of the, um, the regulatory agencies, when I, when I was asking them, okay, well, now, what permits do you have to have in this time frame? You know, they were able to just chime in very quickly and, and to me pointed out how they are a very valuable resource that you can use. And if there aren't any questions, then we'll get ahead of schedule. How's that? Okay. I, I, again, I'm putting on a different hat. So if I am new to the game or I'm a little guy and I just got some mice and I want to ship it, are we, as far as what, what we're having people walk away with, some people have this sense that, well, I'll just call up a shipper and he'll just do it for me. So I guess what we're trying to let these people know is that you have to play a role too. Exactly. The shipper, uh, you, you, you need to have that dialogue and you need to establish what they're going to be responsible for or what you will do or you need to have your list and compare lists and that's when you know that you have a shipper that's good because he, if he's been in the game, 
he would also be asking the same questions. Right. His checklist should look something like the checklist that we're talking about, but this idea that, well, I'll just sit back and let the carrier do it all. We, we, that's what we're trying to get people to know that you, you have can't to think. Do that. You can't yeah. do that. You can't do that. And in my opinion, then, you are shirking your responsibility in this, in this role, in that even though you may not be responsible for physically carrying the animals from one, um, one site to the next, or you may rely on the shipper to get all the proper documents, you need to be familiar with the process. And, and in that way, you're able to ask the right questions when you're vetting those those companies you need to, to feel comfortable with what they're doing because it, it really is your responsibility ultimately for the whole process so you need to at least be familiar with all the different steps okay. I guess so yeah since we're kind of early what, we can take what, a few questions what, air, what airline did you use to ship the animals? Doesn't this sort of beg the question? I thought the problem was that you couldn't uh, ship on, on airlines. Well, with, um, you know, like we learned yesterday with the, um, let's say for the, for the mouse shipment, yeah, we're talking about 20 mice, we're talking about probably one, maybe two crates. Right. Well, well, Commercial let's, airline. Let's do the primate. Okay, the primate, that one probably is going to require a charter air, airline. Whoa. It, it's going to be a very expensive endeavor. And unfortunately, because the domestic airlines are not, you know, they are not carrying non-human primates for research, period, around human primates. It would most likely be ground transportation. Even from Canada? Even from Canada. Okay. Okay. Well, and that was the thing when I was trying to go through this scenario is, is, is um, and maybe the, well, the, the fish and wildlife person's not here, maybe the CDC person can, can, um, answer this question is is what port I wasn't exactly sure which port would be the proper entry on ground transportation so I switch it to a flight we do say in the regulation that they have to come through a port that has a CDC quarantine station mm -hmm. unless it's been previously approved and uh, and okay so we do have instances where animals are driven across the port we don't have any ports that you drive across that have stations mm -hmm. so we we have to know where they're coming from what port they're coming into and we will grant an exception on cases like that. And also to make it easier, if you're going to do non-human primates, it's really easy. You just contact a registered importer, and they do all that work that you just talked about. <laughs> right. But again, you still ought to be familiar with the process. And, and um, again, another reason why, contact the specific agencies that are involved in these type of shipments, because they're going to also help you with figuring out what's going to be the most effective and, and safest and quickest way to get them over here. <laughs> 